uh, relational knowledge graph space. And you know, as you understand, uh, language models and knowledge graphs go together. So this is the team of people um, that work for this um, presentation. We've been experimenting a lot with uh, reasoning and, uh, and Gen AI, knowledge graphs and Gen AI together. So I will just keep it quick. So, um, uh, so here's what we are going to do. We are going to cover a little bit of stage setting, some of the things that we did last time, revisited uh, uh, a year later. Uh, and uh, then we are going to get into a bunch of new things that have happened. We go on to the next slide. A bunch of new things that have happened since that space. And we will focus on a few major ones, uh, primarily the one about multi-shot prompting and then about self-discovery as a certain, uh, a certain framework for developing sophisticated uh, LLM-based programs. And um, in the meantime, we also have a whole bunch of other things uh, besides these two that have to do with integrating with... Uh, uh, symbolic computing integrating with uh, with solvers. It's really, I mean, this should not be a surprise. We feel that it's the combination of the real world knowledge, the linguistic competence of LLMs, plus the formalized representations that traditional uh, con constraint solvers have been very good at. It's that combination that makes for a really powerful uh, set of tools to work with. So this is what we talked about a year ago to lay the stage for what has happened and pretty much this is the same uh, situation we are in today. There are a whole bunch of my colleagues, uh, some of them use the word AI bros, who would like you to believe that we are on the path to human extinction, whatever, AGI, right? Grand glorious future where we've got tools that are able to operate as humans do with collective intelligence significantly beyond human capability. I'm not one of those guys. We are very practical people trying to build real products for real consumers now using these technologies. And in doing so, uh, a year ago, what we presented was this point of view, okay, if you have this mindset that you are a very practical person, an engineer trying to get stuff built, what has happened? What has changed with a GPT-4? And this is the slide that we put up. What has fundamentally changed is that we've got a new kind of computer uh, in uh, available to us, you know, uh, uh, it's the first computer, first generation of computers that you could uh, think of as being uh, designed for humans in the sense that they are dealing with language somewhat in the way that humans do. Uh, and again, by language, I mean text, tables, documents, a whole bunch of sequenced media that we use to communicate with other humans and with computers. Uh, and the big change here is that instead of all the formal programming languages that we have worked on for decades, where you have to go formalize the real world in your head and then write down the code for doing certain manipulations on a representation that you design. Instead of writing all the code for doing that in your computer, that's the old way of doing it. Those are the boxes that you see out there. We are now in a position to go a little bit meta, in a position now to talk with our new computers, these things that you see up there via text. What kind of text and how? Well, okay, that's the big deal. And that's what we'll be spending a whole lot of time on. Uh, that brings enormous power and brings enormous challenges. Um, so the big deal that has happened is instead of just the old style computers and instead of people being our only exemplars of entities, information processes that understand language, we now have these new hybrid creatures that behave a little bit like humans and a little bit like old computers, very much like old computers in the sense that scale. These things are able to, uh, pro able to work at a cycle that is much more consistent with this sort of cycle than that and at a scale which is much more compatible with this than that, but they're able to process language which this could never do and that does. So good, so we got a new computer now and the whole goal is to figure out how we can use this computer to do stuff for us, can you go to the next slide please, uh, in an interesting way. So this is the old 1.0, 2.0 way of looking at things for me. Uh, as I said, I've uh, done a bunch of work in programming languages, that's my major area. Uh, in constraint programming and high performance computing and so on. For me, this is a big enough divide to say, we have now entered a CS 2.0 regime. In the 1.0 regime, it was about what I said a minute ago. It's about uh, figuring out how humans pro figure out how to represent a situation in the real world uh, in a computer and how to write the code when you know how to solve a problem that's what you used to do in computer science. You had to have an algorithm, a representation, write the code, get it done, 
that's how we used to work. But now it's a little bit different. And now it's different primarily because what the heck do you do when you don't actually know how to write the code? And I mean here things like this obvious example from uh, Fei-Fei Li and folks back in ImageNet a long time ago. Your goal is to take a picture and label it with a task with a simple word like people, child, house, and study. How the heck am I going to write the procedural code in the old way of doing business uh, for such a problem? I don't even know the complexity of representing all the bits in this image. Some of them are important, some of them are not important. On what basis do I figure that out, et cetera, et cetera. So big challenge there. But what we do have available to us now is a lot of data. In this case, a lot of labeled data, which hopefully we can use using machine learning algorithms we can use to train a new box, which effectively given uh, as input, uh, this uh, sort of an image will come back out with the label of this following kind, even on unseen images that were not part of uh, that were not part of the training set. So that's the whole magic of machine learning. I do not have time to go into it in any detail, but what I will do is uh, go to this slide to get quickly to uh, the point of view of where do large language models, where do transformers come in? And they come in primarily because, well, so there's a whole a sort of uh, whole uh, separate talk to give on what uh, deep learning is about and what transformer architectures are about. But let me just quickly reprise for you what's happening with large language models is they are built on a specific kind of deep learning architecture where what it turns out, what is really important here is that first of all, it's deep, meaning you have many, many layers, potentially uh, hundreds of layers, and you have something called attention, which you can think of as a way of taking some input representations and, and uh, uh, figuring out from them a bias, uh, a certain uh, a set of weights that depend upon the similarity of the input representations to each other. You're doing this in an attention level, one level, there are a whole bunch of multi-headed attention things going on at, a, at one level, and then you've got these stacked up very deep. Ultimately, what this is help, what this is doing computationally for you is uh, you're getting it, and this is all trained end to end on your data. You feed data in at the at the bottom, at the very top, you will get out whatever label it is that uh, this whole system is being trained to generate. Uh, that label you compare with what is supposed to be the label because of your trained uh, training data. And if it's not the same, you'll get a loss, you propagate that loss, you change the weights. This is how this whole system learns, very deep stacked through these uh, pointwise connections between, uh, between ultimately the inputs as managed by this attention list. And I'm saying something about attention because this will turn out to be quite critical for understanding this new uh, framework for uh, multi-shot learning or what's in context learning as is being exploited now with multi-shot stuff. And it turns out that attention has a crucial role to play. But in any case, whatever it is, think of it as you've got a big deep learning architecture. The uh, input that you can provide to it is language, something like cat on the hot tin. And what you get out of it as the next thing coming out, as the thing that is coming out is what is a probability distribution on the tokens that can follow this. That's the causal language model self-supervision. I'm jumping through a whole lot of it because I assume now people have become really familiar with this stuff. I just want to lay the ground for where we are. Uh, and so what this is giving you is now a box that can input language and output language. So ultimately from a computer science point of view, this is where we are focused. We've got a computing engine that we can send text to and that produces text and has been trained on massive amounts of data uh, what data, data, text data that's available on the net. Um, and there's certain other steps that are needed as well in order to actually make it so that it can follow instructions. In the input, you can say, please do this, this, and this. And it's actually doing something that is in terms of the processing that it does that is consistent with the instructions you just gave. So a whole bunch of extra steps uh, uh, that uh, come about because of this. But the real question that you are faced with now is, okay, what kinds of inputs? I'm not programming this machine. My program is input text. What kinds of programs work? How complicated can my text be? How much extra input can I supply in my text uh, to this program in order for it to do the task that I need to do? That is the central question in front of us, developing, so to speak, a programming methodology for LLM-based uh, uh, computers. Can you go on to the next slide? Thank you. All right. So. Uh, in the, over this last year, there's a whole bunch of new developments that have happened that are 
pushing forward our understanding of this space. Uh, so one of the most uh, interesting directions that people have gone into is increasing the context size. So this text that you feed in is bounded. You can't feed in uh, huge amounts of text. So it used to be that you could feed in maybe 4K tokens. Uh, text gets uh, uh, chunked into things called, it gets uh, tokenized, small tokens, roughly parts of words. Let's just think of them as words. So, you know, maybe 4K words. Turns out a whole lot of things you want to do, 4K is not good enough. Okay, so people went to 32K, 128K. You can get GPT-4 with 128K tokens. That's a lot. You can accomplish a lot of stuff. But GPT, but uh, Gemini came out now with a 1 million token. And there are technical papers out there that are talking about how you can go significantly beyond 1 million. And that would be absolutely amazing to see essentially an unbounded input uh, length. Uh, but that's been significant progress in the sense that there is now Gemini 1.5 Pro available to anyone in this room. You sign up, you pay a little amount of money, and now you can feed an LLM a million tokens. Just think about it. A million tokens is like uh, many hundred pages worth of information in a single query that you're sending to your computer. That query can contain data, it can contain uh, what you want it to do, and it comes back having processed that stuff. So significant more power because of this. Again, there's a whole lot of underlying technology and what makes that work. That's not appropriate for this thing, uh, for this talk, so we're not going to go there. A major thing uh, that is happening, though, is um, so there are three things that really an LLM gives you. First, it gives you some built-in knowledge about the real world. That's incorporated in the weights that it has learned, billions of weights that it has learned, uh, uh, the values of which it has learned through its pre-training process. So it's knowledge of the real world in those weights. Second is facility with language. And that facility with language essentially comes about just because of that little function that we showed you predict the next token. Again, I'm talking mainly GPT here and GPT class so-called decoder only machines. There are other variants of these that we're not going to talk about. So for them, you're really just training this whole pre-training stuff uh, step by just getting it to predict that next token, a probability distribution on the next tokens. So three things, one, knowledge of the world. Second, a great facility in working with language. And the third big thing is this, I think, there are very, very few people around, if any, who would say they were not surprised when they saw in-context learning. So in-context learning came, uh, first real manifestation of it came about with GPT-3. And turns out what you can do is you can take a little uh, prompt, ask it to do a certain thing, and provide some examples of your new, you may have just made up this task. Um, and provided a few examples of the input for the task and the output for the task. A little bit like what you are setting up for a real machine learning run where you're trying to fine tune an engine. So in my input to this computer, I'm providing a bunch of examples of input output labeled pairs. That's it. And then I give it a new input pair and ask it to produce the answer. So I'm not training anything here. It's the, the weights in this uh, GPT-4 or Gemini are going to remain absolutely unchanged, even after it has returned its answer to me. But what we see is that there are many, many, many patterns expressed that we can express via our choice of input output uh, examples in text, in context, that's what it's called, in context. Many, many patterns that the system is able to figure out even patterns that we have no reason to believe it has ever seen before. And it can complete the example that we provide without that output. This is called in-context learning. It stunned everyone when it came out uh, because uh, nobody had an explanation for what the heck is going on. This thing, we've usually um, associated this improvement in behavior by providing a bunch of examples with some kind of machine learning going on. And machine learning was always stateful. There are a bunch of parameters as a result of learning, you're changing the values of those parameters, they become uh, uh, different. And they have, so to speak, learned about the phenomena. And now you probe it with the new thing, you get an answer. Here, there is no state, and there's still learning going on. So it's a very surprising thing that has happened. A lot more progress now on understanding where it works. And most importantly, we now have with the, G with the Gemini, this possibility that those millions of tokens, you could use them for sending in 50,000 examples 
100,000 examples of a new, day, a new problem that you are interested in that the system has never seen before. You may just have generated those. And you know, there's a strong possibility that you will actually be able to get results on a new example that you give without having done any fine tuning whatsoever. So look at it as a lazy man's or a lazy person's fine tuning uh, possibility. This now opens up with that progress in ICL and I will present a bunch of data about this as we go. So that's, uh, that's a big thing that we will uh, be spending time on in this, uh, in this talk today. There is a bunch of stuff about making fine tuning uh, far easier to do, quicker, cheaper. Uh, a way of making this completely vivid is that just last week, uh, people came out, I think it was the Hugging Face people, came out with, okay, we've got 310 new LLMs. And what they did was they took about 31 uh, data sets or 10 base LLMs and used this LoRa PEP technique to uh, train those to get a new instance, fine-tuned instances uh, of the base LLMs on this data, uh, on this data set. And they are able to do it. What this is really doing is performance efficient fine tuning. It's really looking at, do we actually need these big 32 bit weights in order to capture the relevant information during machine learning? Turns out you often don't. You can reduce it to four bits, in some weird cases to two bits and still get great performance. So that's what that whole area is about. And I think we're going to increasingly see more and more work that shows you do not need a 175 billion parameter model in order to gain real advantage of the sorts of things we are seeing. You are able to squeeze it down into smaller and smaller uh, models. This we will cover as part of uh, the ICL stuff. Uh, it's a question to ask, um, you've got this new computer, what can it do out of the box? Broadly, we already said what it can do. You can give text, it'll produce text. Okay, but let's talk hardcore computer science. What kind of computable functions does it know how to operate on out of the box? Turns out with the Gemini, for example, uh, now it can, okay, let me ask you guys this. Do you think it can do sorting? Obviously, since I'm asking, you will say yes. Okay, sorting of 10 long lists, 100 long lists, 20 long lists, you know, efficient, uh, correctly. Let us say 90% or more accuracy. Any ideas? 1,000 long, 100,000 long? Okay, it's not that wild, uh, but you can get uh, sorting at the level of uh, something like uh, better than 50% accuracy for 200 long lists of numbers between say one to 100, not massive numbers. No, sir, the prompt is, I want you to sort this list. And here's the list, 100 long. And I'm not giving any multi-shot examples of sorting, right? So it, I'm relying on its internal knowledge of what sorting means. Turns out you can get great answers. There's again, a whole bunch more of examples here. For example, linear classification, even non-linear regression, Turns out, out of the box, an LLM, you give it a problem. Here, you would be using, uh, uh, for a regression problem, you'd be giving it examples of uh, your uh, instances of your uh, regression problem, in input and output, some number of those. Complicated ones. And it's able, uh, Gemini is what I've tried on. Others, the papers that we'll talk about, I've tried on Claude and GPT-4. These roughly, I will call, uh, the GPT-4 uh, class of uh, 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 computers or class of LLMs. It turns out you can actually get uh, linear and nonlinear uh, regression uh, working very well, even a complicated function such as uh, Boolean parity checking. How many you know, XORs for a long sequence of Boolean? Uh, you're counting the number of uh, these things that are one. Complicated function, you can get uh, these guys to do. Please. GPT. I can ask chat, I can ask ChatGPT to generate the code for regression, and then I can ask ChatGPT to execute it. No, sir. that is not what I'm saying. This is not what I, right, right. I want you to make sure. I make, I want Thank, to you. Thank you for asking. You can absolutely do those things. And ChatGPT, sorry, I, I haven't spent much time with ChatGPT. Yeah. GPT-4 will do that. It will generate all kinds of complicated mm -hmm. code. Last year we showed it generating code for uh, uh, essentially a traveling salesman problem, right? That's beautiful and wonderful in its own right. Here I'm saying out of the box, I'm giving you the input output pairs, some number of them for a new function. I'm not even naming that function. I'm simply giving it a new input and saying, give me the output. 
And in the case of these parity functions and so on, you get, uh, you're not getting 100%, you're not going to stop doing old computer science, but you're getting a very surprising performance of over 40% correct with this kind of in-context learning, whereas uh, you, know, you try to use uh, GPT-4 directly uh, and ask it to do it, you're not going to get a lot of mileage. Okay, so there's a surprising amount of new stuff going on here to try to characterize this computer. What can we actually do with this? I'll ask you another question here that might hopefully get you thinking about it. I'm assuming you guys have worked with LLMs. Okay, what is the most complex, what, what is, I'd love to see from you uh, an example of an input uh, uh, program, uh, an input to an LLM, uh, with let us say the output is to be bounded. It is still you know, not growing with N, it's bounded uh, amount of output, but where your LLM is taking way more time than it has ever taken on other problems that you've tried, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, if this is really computing functions, we know there are some functions that are very hard to compute. It takes a lot of time to compute. So I've got bounded input, bounded output. I should still be getting able to get it to do some really huge amount of processing. So think about that. How And we have, I have managed to get it to do, you know, spend minutes, GPT-4, uh, to come back with an answer, whereas for most queries, maybe it's going to be 10 seconds, but here it's minutes, it's still thinking about what's going on. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff to do here to understand how does this do its computation. Now, one of the major problems we face with the, uh, using LLMs in practice is that, um, is that um, uh, we're going to produce a lot of text. So some people have said that Sam Altman uh, killed email because now with GPT-4, it's so easy to produce all sorts of spam email that your spam filters cannot catch. I think we, LLMs will kill documents. It's very easy now to get LLMs to produce professional documents that look and smell like real documents, but may not be real documents. So it's going to become very, very difficult in a professional setting like uh, you know, finance uh, to understand uh, how to earmark things, content that is actually human generated and different from uh, machine generated content. And it's probably going to come back to being actually able to interactively work with your data set, that's going to be uh, an important characteristic. Uh, but here, uh, the thing that I'm pointing out is that if you're going to produce a lot of text, you need to know, if you're going to do this in production, you need to know that the text being produced is stuff that you can trust your investor, your portfolio manager to consume and go take actions in the real world based on that. And they're not <laughs> going to get led astray. So it's a huge problem to figure out when is the setup that you have your LLM, the input you gave it, when is it producing output that is, so to speak, not grounded in reality. So an important way to do that is to figure out how to quote, fact check the output. There are nice, a bunch of nice papers now that have worked this out to some extent. And the ultimate problem here is the output is natural language. You've got to now kind of do the reverse thing and go from text to what are the decontextualized facts in the text? So you can send them to something else, some other piece of code to go check whether those things are true or not. So that's a technical uh, language problem, NLP problem, and there are good uh, progress now on solving it. Again, uh, there are pointers we can give you to all of this, don't have time to do this. Self-discovery I'm gonna talk about, let's leave it there. This is also a very big deal for us. Uh, Nico is going to talk about this. We're going to skip over this, uh, but for finance, for modeling real world, uh, phenomena, this is a very, very crucial thing to do. And uh, we used to do things with causality extraction from text based on the old NLP stacks. Um, uh, and now uh, there's far more powerful techniques available with LLMs to do it. Um, so so that's, a, that's a big deal. We'll talk about graph rag. This is uh, the idea that if there is a query that you need to process uh, with an LLM, uh, again, it's the massive input size that is your friend. You may have a query that's just two, three, four sentences long, but now you've got a whole lot more input that you can give to it. So how do you augment this query with relevant information that's going to get better answers from the LLM than if you did not do that? That's retrieval augmented generation, generation being the thing that the LLM does at the end. So the whole game is how do you retrieve properly to actually add value and not noise to it. 
So a bunch of ideas which are sort of obvious that have come out now. Microsoft guys have uh, published here. I think we are going to talk about this as well, where instead of thinking of all your resources, text resources available to you in the standard way of doing it is you take your text resources, you break them into chunks, you vectorize those chunks, you take your input, you vectorize it. Now you find similar vectors and you add it to get the text, add it to your input, send it to this darn guy. That's vanilla uh, retrieval augmented generation. Doesn't help for a whole bunch of queries. Does not work at all. You're trying to do comparative analysis. You are a financial guy and you know the earnings season has just come out and uh, there's a whole bunch of earnings announcements say in banking. You want to know, the question you're asking is, uh, what is the trend across all of this? What are the major things that have appeared? Those trends, uh, a simple way of explaining what is the problem with RAG is this. Uh, someone else did it, it's not me. Uh, the question is not the answer. You are actually looking at this question and looking for stuff that is similar to it to find answers wrong. It may just not, the answer may have a completely different linguistic form than the question. So moving from the linguistic form of the question to that answer is a difficult, subtle problem. Graph rag, where you actually go from that text representation to some more abstract knowledge graph style representation where there's an explicit calling out of concepts, uh, facts, relationships, so on and so forth, offers the opportunity where given your input text, you go to some nodes in this graph and then you pull the relevant things around that node. So you are now working not just at the level of text similarity, which is what vectors do, but you're working at the level of whatever knowledge extraction you had done, whatever view of the world you had explicitly extracted from all of this text, you're leveraging that directly. We will talk about this stuff. Okay, we've got this. Uh, um, I think, uh, yep, so the rest of the box is uh, Nico saying time to move on. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, uh, this I've discussed, so let's go on. Um, excellent. Uh, are you doing this, Nico? Am I? Uh, I think you start without okay. I'll start and then you can get going. Okay. Uh, this is again a reprise of something we showed last year. What we showed was uh, all right, so you're going to now try, you've got a lot of text. And from this text, you want to extract facts according to some ontology. Uh, the old way of doing things is open ended relation extraction. Again, natural language, a lot of uh, techniques for doing it. None of them really worked very well. Uh, and one of the requirements for a number of those techniques is that you have a prior ontology, a prior set of concepts that you're interested in extracting. Uh, here, uh, we uh, are trying to do it in a way where all we know, and the example we gave last year was, all I know is that I care about the earnings season and I care about extracting knowledge from the earnings reports that are coming in. So the first thing I do is I ask my LLM, that's your task to extract information about uh, the real world structured for what might be of interest to a financial analyst from earnings reports. Please propose what is an ontology for this. And here we're doing something very similar. So again, you go one level indirect, it's so trying to solve the problem, you pose the problem to the machine and see if it can solve that problem. So here's what we say. By the way, this is a running uh, thing that we are doing. We did it last year, we're repeating it this year. You have to work with some sort of complicated real world domain in order to illustrate various ideas. Uh, I can't work in finance here because that's my private job. Uh, I can talk about uh, movies and uh, so on and I will actually when I get a chance. But here what we picked up was New York City, you need to guide people who are coming to New York City for things that they can do, you need to design their schedule and so on. So now I want to get actually uh, a knowledge graph. Out of this. So here's what I say, please extract from the description given to you uh, key terms, relationships, what you would expect. Here's meta information about what I'm looking for. It's not an ontology, it's like a pre-ontology. Give it this and I tell it, hey, there's a knowledge graph I'm going to be adding stuff to. Again, I don't know if it's crucial that I tell it this. I don't know if it really knows something about knowledge graph. That's a whole different ballgame to go into about how we can systematically probe these LLMs to figure out what is it that they understand about various concepts like this. Uh, it's a different research topic to go on. So we tell it, okay, um, I'm going to, and you can emit JSON, you can emit uh, data log, different. I think we're going to talk about emitting in relational AI as well. So we give it a schema for the kind of thing it must produce. And then we give it the event ID and we give it the passage and we ask it to, uh, to produce stuff. Next slide, please. And this is the example of something that uh, um, one of our colleagues uh, uh, actually uh, extracted, you know, went off and extracted from the event bright. 
uh, just an example of a description. Let's go take a look at what that thing produced. <coughs> Next slide, please. Yep. So you get this. Now, this isn't quite a knowledge graph in the usual sense because most of the sort of uh, values in this, I have, of course, uh, identified here concepts like descriptions, activities, interests, location, and so on. Uh, but most of the content here is text, but it's not very difficult to break it down into also symbols instead of pieces of text. You have to do uh, some named entity resolution to do that, but that's also pretty well understood. My bottom line here is simply to say, it's as easy as this now to generate, um, to generate uh, uh, a knowledge graph, uh, facts that populate a knowledge graph from just raw text. Uh, but a caveat, uh, if I work in deep domains, complex domains, and it's not so easy to make this work in really complex domains because there are subtleties of understanding the concepts that uh, um, it is not at all clear that this machine knows out of the box and you try to get it to answer questions and you fail miserably. So I'll give you a, a simple example of this. Um, so... Um, there is, um, in the investment space, there is something, uh, you know, people, uh, I'm talking about fundamental analysis, people will write things called, uh, the people, analysts will write an analysis of a particular ticker, investment, from an investment point of view. So they will look at what are the headwinds that are faced, what are the tailwinds that are faced by this particular company. They're going to produce a page, maybe five pages of dense text that captures their view on what's going to happen. Obviously, it would be very valuable to check it for consistency. In other words, are they saying something in one place that contradicts what they're saying in another place? Now, another human can go sit down, look at all of this and do it. Our challenge is to get LLMs to do it. For this uh, notion, uh, I'd call it a pretty sophisticated notion. Uh, we've tried, I've tried to uh, generate a, uh, without using uh, multi-shot training. So just zero shot. Uh, try to get this program to work in a way that would satisfy our professional users, very, very difficult, not able to do it. The point is that this notion of consistency is very specific to a domain and is sort of deeply understood by professionals in that domain. There was no reason to believe that this uh, uh, LLM uh, would actually train on all the stuff the net have actually captured that, but because we see amazing behavior elsewhere, we think it might, so we tried didn't work. So there are examples now of where a GPT-4, and I should have said before, uh, LLMs, I mean GPT-4 class LLMs whenever I'm saying this, because you can get the open source LLMs and they are getting way better, but they're not quite at the level of capability of these things. So uh, simple domains, you get some uh, really uh, uh, good answers out of the box. And now, of course, the goal is to iterate. The big challenge is I, if I use that query on one simple uh, description, it'll come back with some choice of those predicates that you saw. Give it another one, it might come back with another one. So that's a problem because now you've got to reconcile all of these names across all of these. So the obvious thing to do is run it once or a few times, you'll get a bunch of examples. Now you put those exemplars in. This is uh, again, uh, the few in context learning that I was talking about. And now you will find more or less the same attributes that you have uh, uh, identified in your initial examples are the ones that it is producing information for. So it's a very simple way to bootstrap it, to get into a coherent ontology. Uh, and of course you can add, uh, if you see, you can curate that ontology and you don't have to do it this way. You could get a human to look at it and add that stuff. So you are able to do, uh, get the system to do a better job. Next slide, please. Okay, now it's all yours. Yeah, that's my son. So I want to confess something that um, I realized that there was something wrong with the order of representation and I actually tried to edit on my phone. So I think I made ah. it. Let's see. Oh my God. I see. Uh, I, I yeah. mm -hmm. Well, let's see if that works. Like, uh, it's a special skill. Have you ever tried to edit a presentation on your phone? It's not the easiest thing, but you can do it. But you didn't use an LLM, so you should be good. No, I, was, I was the LLM. <laughs> anyway. So this is kind of like a small demo, if you want, of what Vijay described over here. Um, you know, you, you've all heard about RAG and everybody talks about graph RAG. So what I will attempt to do over here is uh, crawl uh, Wikipedia. <coughs> we got about a hundred uh, bios, resumes, and uh, actually 50, no, 100. And um, we try to extract facts and then answer questions. Um, and um, this is kind of like the prompt. 
It took several iterations to come up with a prompt. It wasn't easy, but so far it works. Um, and the idea is that, you know, Vijay, you talked before, you're trying to extract relations and entities, but you're also trying to make sure that you keep the redundancy low. You will always have redundancy, okay? So you, you will say somebody was employed or worked for or, you know, did business with. It will never be, you know, the clean, nice ontology that um, probably this community five years ago was used to that doesn't exist anymore. Like if, if we want to utilize LLMs and go wild, we have to use, um, uh, you know, ontologies that they're redundant. And um, here, for example, when we do the retrieval and say which university a friend Vijay um, uh, has attended, it is trying to find out or the, um, the relevant ones. And here's kind of like the, um, the prompt. Oh, no, it's not the problem here. Now, once we find them, we have to go, you don't know this language, but it's still evolving. This is the language that we're using. And that's a nice thing that, um, despite the fact that um, ChatGPT or GPT-4 hasn't really seen that language, by, which, by the way, looks a lot like data log or functional declarative language, we were still able to create templates. Um, we gave examples, what is the abstract question what is um, a concrete question, and this is what you need to generate. And it, the, the ability to generalize has improved a lot. Um, here's kind of like uh, the, the prompt um, that we used, and here's where we provide all the examples. What we realize is that it is fairly easy to structurally, you know, in a structured way, keep adding more and more examples. Think about them as instructions. Okay, so this is the poor man's instruction tuning. We didn't have the, <laughs> the infrastructure to go and fine tune instruction tuning model, but we realized that you can go slowly and give examples very carefully curated, and the system, you know, uh, learns. And um, so this is more about, uh, in some cases, it needs to synthesize, it needs to do uh, conjunctions, disjunctions to do that. So this is actually, I don't want to bother you. You're going to get the slides. And if you want, you can look at that in detail. And, um, and then you generate the query and then uh, you pass it back to, um, uh, to the LLM to give you the answer. So these are some questions. I just want to mention something that these are questions that you could have potentially done with typical RAG. But the problem is that the problem with RAG is that it can never guarantee that it returns all the results. Okay, we'll find some documents that they have. So if you're looking for one answer, RAG most of the times will get it as long as it doesn't have to jump around a lot. So, um, you know, which universities has VJI attended? It generates the query. When did Steve uh, Jobs die? That's probably one that, you know, typical RAG would have given you or find all companies in the software industry it wouldn't have been able to do that unless you were doing this careful uh, extraction. So just to be clear that uh, uh, rel code was generated by GPT-4 yes. and then executed in rel and to get you that answer. Yes, 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 yes. So this is a more complicated one and it gets that, let's say 95% right. So Vijay asked me, says, can you provide, because he's in the financial industry and there is a lot of value in um, know your customer and money laundering and you want to make sure that two people were never linked together. So say list of all people who have collaborated in one way or another um, before. Now collaborated in a business setting can, can be in several ways. So what happened over here, it did find uh, relations like, you know, person, person employed at a company or a person was a member of a company or person was owner of a company or person like uh, was a founder of a company, but it doesn't do cross check. So you can find if two people were founders, co-founders, if two people worked, but if I was the founder and VJ was working over there, yeah, it needs to create more uh, um, disjunctions over here to do that, which we can teach it to do that. Um, this is quite common and it's, it's still an unsolved problem. But the interesting thing is that the language model can basically enumerate all possible combinations of relations that you need. And then you, you can actually score them. And 
Like you can go back to the user and say, well, are you interested in this case or in this case? Or you can start learning what, which combinations are the relevant one. And if that starts to remind you of something, this is what probabilistic programming uh, was trying to do for many years. Okay, and I think we're getting closer to that through a completely different path. So you basically find all possible ways to answer a question and then you score them. And if you want to be exhaustive, you are exhaustive. So let's see if we, we figure. So that's the tricky part right now with the uh, this in, constant le in context learning. I did like in context, ed uh, context editing. So Jay, let's see. Oh, <laughs> so take it from here. Okay, thank you. You can go to the next slide, please. So I've already covered uh, much of this material in abstract fashion. Now let's just go through some of the papers and talk about it. So as I said, from a computer science point of view, it's a very simple thing. You've got a new computing element. What the heck is going on? How does it work? Getting to a causal understanding of how a computing element works is critical to using it reliably in all sorts of uh, contexts. So the first paper that from a theory point of view tried to illustrate what it might be the mechanism in, in context learning is this. So it depends. So this is from these folks at Stanford University, uh, great authors here, by the way. Um, it uh, uh, relies on the following intuition that, again, all we are doing is taking this deep attention-based network, feeding it uh, uh, text and asking to predict the next thing. So whatever computational phenomena we are seeing is ultimately going to come from that. We're talking about the pre-training step. So here the idea is that, hey, likely this deep layer of uh, attention uh, stack of attention layers is actually learning latent variables that correspond to some semantic representation at a document level. So at much larger context lengths, in order for it to be able to successfully predict that next token. And so the idea is that that machinery for uh, figuring out some uh, abstract representation of a pattern uh, in long pieces of text that machinery already exists in these um, attention-based LLMs. Um, now, what we are doing when we are giving it certain examples within a prompt is we are offering it examples that are quite out of the distribution from which the system was trained. Because trained on massive amounts of data, that distribution is roughly speaking the text on the net. And now we're talking of extremely specific examples for which you want to learn. Uh, so there's a clash between the distribution of the pre-training data and the distribution of the prompt. But the idea is that if in fact, uh, the system is able to find a pattern in these elements that, since it's already been trained to find patterns, if you can find a pattern in these elements uh, that, uh, by the way, its ability to do this becomes uh, much better when the example lengths are improving. Uh, and here, even examples without labels help. So in other words, you don't have the output label. You just have a whole bunch of input examples. That is allowing it to figure out uh, the pattern using its machinery for uh, these uh, discovering uh, document length patterns and then applying it on this input example gets you the answer. They have a much nicer way of explaining all this than I have stumbled through in the last minute. Uh, and they have actually got a proof that this works in a specific context where they picked a very concrete model of document generation from a mixture of HMMs. And they showed that in that context, this is how uh, this, could, uh, this could work. So that's great. Um, let's go on. This was just two years ago. Here is a simple example that illustrates all this. Okay, we are asking in our query, something like uh, examples are Albert Einstein was German, Gandhi was Indian, Marie Curie was. The system is supposed to answer this. And so the idea is that in the data that this was trained on, possibly there's a whole lot of wiki data so there's possibly a latent variable that corresponds to the fact that this piece of text that you are seeing is associated with uh, wiki uh, biographies. And in that context, a natural thing, as you see there, I, Albert Einstein, full name is provided, uh, was a German, the nationality is provided. In that context, it makes sense that the LLM is able to pick out through that part what the answer, uh, what the answer should be. So this was a nice explanation for what could possibly be going on. Let's go on one more level. Here is, uh, and um, uh, no, I think one more. This is slightly out of place, yeah. So this is uh, another paper that came out um, uh, last year 
where they go into a lot more depth from, uh, from Microsoft people on what could be going on. And they make this very interesting analogy that this, and this is what I was talking about earlier, that attention is actually an important component of all of this. They're making the analogy between what the transformer attention mechanism does to weights is actually quite similar. They use the word dual. I'm very reluctant to use the word dual in this context, but their word is dual. Is dual to what stochastic gradient descent does on weights. So in other words, there is something, remember, stochastic gradient descent is working in the backward direction. You send your stuff, your input through the network, you get an output, you compare it with the, with the thing, generate a loss, send it back to update. That's what gradient descent does, is find, compute those gradients and find how things should be tweaked. Here we're talking the forward pass. ICL works purely in the forward pass. There is no backward pass. You're just executing, you just, uh, right? So, uh, so this is a interesting, uh, not very obvious analogy that what attention is doing can mathematically be understood as what gradient descent does. And so um, uh, essentially uh, the gradients that are generated by looking at these examples um, through attention uh, work a little bit like in situ uh, updates on weights when they are applied, meaning applied in context, not applied uh, in terms of changing the underlying weights, but they're applied in the context of existing weights. That's how you get, uh, you get the behavior that you get with ICL. So their claim is that, hey, ICL is essentially implicit fine tuning. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Oh, if you need to edit, that's okay. You can edit. <coughs> I can move the slides. So, so is that weird? Uh, uh, no. Uh, so uh, now this is good. Thank you. Uh, no, please go ahead. Edit. No, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to see if anything This is this is okay. I can deal with it. So um, um, so uh, now that we have some idea of what this underlying mechanism is, and I mentioned this, so I'll quickly go over this uh, here. Uh, there's a nice paper that just came out a, a couple of weeks ago that says, okay, can we get these LLMs using this machinery of sending input arguments in? Can we get it to do linear regression, nonlinear regression? Here's, and you're talking cloud three GPT-4. I've actually done this on Gemini and the results are uh, quite similar to uh, cloud three results. So they're very good uh, in comparison. So here, what we are doing is, this is just uh, an MX plus uh, B example. Uh, in fact, there's another version where you've got noise also associated with it, and you are trying to get the system to actually predict what the value will be for a new element. In fact, I went one more and asked uh, the uh, uh, Gemini to generate uh, the formula, right? And for linear regression, it's not a problem. It tells you, here's the formula. Here's AX plus B uh, plus noise and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is a much more complicated nonlinear function. Uh, where um, uh, uh, now you are seeing errors. These are all taken, you know, I'm sorry about these things. Um, these are all taken from a distribution. This is sampled from uh, where the numbers are uh, between zero and hundred. Some are much smaller than that X4 and X3. Uh, and so the errors here with plot three are uh, around two, which uh, are taken uh, other machine learning uh, component, other machine learning systems that are trained uh, is, you know, not too bad again. The training here is all in context stuff. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, okay, so this is a paper I strongly recommend people to read. It again came out just about a month ago or so. And this goes into this notion of, we've got a million tokens, let's use it for uh, doing many short uh, learning. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, and they show, here are examples. Before this, the, the sort of orthodoxy, it's hard to say orthodoxy because such a new area, but whatever. The common wisdom was that you don't want to give many shots, just two, three, four are enough. Turns out that's a mistake. That was a limitation of GPT-4 machines that we were using. If you've got a machine that can actually take a lot, give it a lot. And you see here, you know, 18% improve, uh, 18 points improvement. Uh, going to 2048 shots for sentiment analysis compared to a 32 shot. So this paper doesn't provide a lot of theoretical analysis. They just give you a ton of examples to show that many shot is actually working. On next slide, please. Um, and here's the result on the parity stuff. It's 40 percent performance, but compare it with uh, random chance. That's like nowhere. Uh, compare it with a GPT-2 that was trained on about 20 times more data to get to 40%. 
And this is able to, with in-context examples of around, you know, uh, whatever, uh, 8,000 examples, it's able to do better than what was trained with 20, uh, 20 uh, whatever, 20 times more uh, data. Next slide, please. Um, linear classification, uh, more examples of complicated functions here. The point is to show this red stuff is actually uh, uh, K nearest neighbors, KNN. So it's doing sort of uh, like KNN at a large number, which is kind of stunning. Um, again, no explicit training for any of these KNN-like techniques uh, within the, all we did was compute the next token for the sequence. Next, please. Uh, and uh, just so, you know, for me, it raises a very interesting problem where we have a ton of uh, symbolic computing problems. Let's even say NP hard problems. Uh, can we get interesting behavior out of these LLMs on such problems? Because fundamentally, you know, there's this a school of thought that believes NP hard problems. There are just a whole bunch because we don't have a proof uh, for uh, NP hardness. So uh, NP is not equal to P. So maybe there are just a huge number of patterns that are lying out there, which can actually solve uh, which can actually solve these problems. So one way to test that would be to try to get LLMs, which are very, very good at very deep pattern matching, uh, to, to work on, in fact, a combinatorially hard problems. So here, this is what they tried. They've got some kind of a logistics thing. It's nowhere close to what state-of-the-art uh, systems can do. But again, just a few short examples. Uh, they're getting at somewhere around 30%, 38% uh, success rates. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I'll start this with a context learning, but we're doing self-discovery of that. So that's your. So if you remember last year, we talked about this. We tried this problem, call it the tourist in Manhattan, <coughs> which I might actually try to um, to make it a, a formal benchmark. So planning your holiday. So the plan is we have a tourist. is supposed to be this is uh, Gen AI here, a Greek tourist. Uh, uh, he wants to spend a day in Manhattan. And, um, you know, we want to check if the LLM can be a good reasoner. So we're going to see two ways of doing that. One is Vijay is leaving the room. Come back. It's you. <laughs> it's with self-discovery. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. So, so go ahead. I just wanted to say, so we'll try to, to see if it can be automatically done. And if not, you know, how can we help it a little bit? So, BJ, take it. Thank you. All right. So uh, now we are back to uh, programming. How do you program with these LLMs? Next slide, please. Um, so the simple thing to do would be ask it to generate a schedule. Uh, and I think you have some things. We have tried to do that. You don't get really good answers. So there's a, another lovely paper that just came, that just came out. Uh, um, yep. Uh, this is, I think, uh, I don't have the date on it, but it's within the last year or so. So... There is, uh, there's a whole, now what you're doing, the game here is to discover linguistic representations for patterns of reasoning that you can use to trigger the LLM, okay? Uh, and it only takes language as input. So it's got to be linguistic representations. Now, again, it's learned some notion of how humans operate through the data that humans have produced, et cetera. So maybe we can leverage that to be much smarter about how these things do work. So a simple idea behind this is the so-called chain of thought prompting. So here you ask it to not just, this goes back when uh, I was at Goldman uh, a few years ago, there's a lot of interest in trying to get some kind of explanations out of uh, language models. And then uh, 2020, when I started working with GPT-3, it's like, you don't have to worry about this anymore. This thing that's going to generate an answer will generate an explanation of how it produced that answer. Now, it may not be good or it may not be correct because it could be unmoored in what it was actually doing but at least you have another handle to get it to produce that. And now you can provide that as input and say, here's a template for the chain of reasoning that was done to solve a problem like this before. And so guide this into certain patterns of reasoning uh, based on expressing more linguistically about how the solution is derived. So that is an example. Uh, and in fact, I think, uh, um, uh, Cockley was involved in that chain of thought paper as well. This carries that out to a much uh, deeper level. So go next slide, please. Okay, so here's the idea. The idea is that you've got one problem. Maybe this pattern of chain of thought reasoning isn't the right pattern. 
After all, we have many, many patterns as humans for solving complex problems. Why don't we get the LLM to figure out that pattern for this problem on its own? Now we are in the space of what I will talk about towards the end as well. We're in the space of getting LLMs to write the code for LLMs. Okay? So the whole trick is how are you going to accomplish this? So here's what we're going to do at a broad level. We're going to tell the LLM, you have available to you a whole bunch of, we'll call them reasoning modules. It's like in the code, it's not really reasoning modules. Techniques for reasoning, whole bunch of them available. We ask the machine to figure out for this problem, which of these are relevant. And then we ask the machine to specialize the ones it has chosen to the context of this problem. And then we ask it to execute that. So roughly speaking, it's like, here's your problem. Here are all the tools available to you. Go generate something which will work well on this problem using whatever knowledge you've got inside. And then let's go through and see what you get. So let's go on next slide, please. Right, so what they showed was, in fact, this does much better than zero shot chain of thought reasoning on a bunch of uh, academic benchmarks around you know, math reasoning problems and uh, the hard problems in, uh, in a particular benchmarking, uh, uh, benchmarking uh, example. So here 67% um, is the method, is the result with self-discovery with uh, Palm. Uh, and uh, with GPT-4, it's at 81, whereas without using this technique, you would end up at 58. So there's a huge jump in a bunch of these, not so much in this example. Now, let's see how this, what this might mean for our, uh, you've got to have a name for that wonderful looking tourist. I, don't know. I, I never found a name, so yes. be creative here. Think yeah, about it. Spiros, you know, he's one of your, uh, yeah. Okay. Spiros, okay. Uh, great. So uh, we've got Spiros wanting to visit uh, New York City. Uh, with his family. And so our goal is to generate a schedule. So let's try to use self-discover to just frame a simple problem and see what the system comes up with. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here's the list. This is the color I use for uh, input to the LLM. Here's the list that's from the paper. There were 36 reasoners. Uh, and you can see, you know, try creative thinking, generate innovative out of the box ideas. It's sort of almost, uh, you know, motherhood and apple pie but it's useful to have a whole long list of these and give it to the system so that it can choose. Let's go next slide, please. Um, so now this is a, a few steps. This is, the first, this is the prompt for the first step. Select the reasoner. Assistant to a problem solver, given a task description, that's here. You're given in reasoning modules, that's here. And your job is to select some of these that will work here, okay? And here's an, sorry, no, nope, that's an example of the input to the task. So this is uh, Spiros coming in and uh, the task is uh, scheduled for a family of four. Um, and uh, you know, this weekend uh, between five to seven events, total cost under this um, and should be convenient, you know, distance minimization, start from the hotel. I don't know yet what that is. I'm giving a generic task description because I want to get a generic plan, not tied too much to the details of a particular family. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so having done that, you get some output. You feed that output back in here. This is a multi-staged uh, thing. Uh, again, I'm not using words like agents and agentic programming. A uh, number of my AI bro colleagues do that. I'm just showing you what the underlying programming techniques are. You put a label like this is what agents are like and you suddenly take it to a whole different space of science fiction where it's very hard to figure out what people want to see happen and what they're actually able to accomplish. So I'm just focused on what I'm able to accomplish here. So you bring that in, multi-step guy, you bring that in here, uh, you give still the task to be solved and now you ask it to rephrase uh, the reasoning module carefully so it's better suited for this task. This is step two from their paper. I'm not doing anything interesting here, novel by myself. And finally, operationalize. You take that output, feed it in a next step. So I guess there is one, basic meta point here to emphasize. You could say why three steps, right? Uh, in the sort of old computer science 1.0, you define three procedures. Why can't I just inline all of these into one procedure and make one call? Ah, doesn't work so well. Because there is some kind of behaviorally what we see, there's some kind of confusion when in one prompt, you want the LLM to do different things. It doesn't do as well as when you break it up, empirically, right, that's all. So that's why it's done in uh, three steps. Let's go on to the next slide, please. 
Okay, this is what it came out with. I didn't show you those intermediate things, I don't have time. This is what it came out with. Spend a second to look at it. It's not bad at all as a generic plan for addressing uh, scheduling problems in the context of visits to New York City. Uh, uh, no, skip this. Uh, this is all of it. There are four steps. Sorry, back to previous slide. Uh, no, yeah. Uh, there are four steps, okay? And, uh, you know, they are about gather detailed information, uh, compile a comprehensive list of potential elements, transportation options, uh, hotel location nearby, blah, blah. Then use a reasoning module zero, which is named in there, to generate a set of potential schedules, decide their feasibility, and then divide into subtasks and tackle each separate, so on and so forth. So it's a credible way of doing it. Let's go ahead, please. Uh, no, this skip this. Uh, right. So here's what I did. The plan looks great. Now I need to execute it. Turns out, I'll show you that in a minute, but here's the thing that I did that worked. So I uh, took that plan. That's the execution plan. Took that task description. Here the task description includes specific stuff about the family. Um, and ask it to give me just the list of events that are appropriate for this family for this weekend. I gave it only uh, uh, events from this weekend, so I didn't have to search a very large database. Came back with some pretty reasonable uh, uh, events. I don't have uh, the details here on show you which ones these are, but let's go to the next slide. Um, now, what if we try to execute this directly? So what would we do? We'd have to write another prompt. That prompt is saying, Okay, you're going to take the shortlisted events here as input, and now you describe all your constraints on what the schedule should look like. You know, events uh, should be on the same day as the schedule. Why am I doing stupid stuff like this? This, it should know. Well, okay, try it. It doesn't know. So of course it depends a whole lot on the level, the temperature at which you're doing this. I'm doing this with Gemini 1.5 Pro. I'm asking you to do a combinatorially hard problem to actually come out to the schedule. It turns out that all of this stuff that I'm saying, some of those constraints, it will faithfully execute. Others it'll ignore. The next time I try it, some other ones will be faithfully executed. Some other ones will be ignored. It becomes a nightmare to try to actually get this to work reliably for this problem. So let's do the next one uh, in here. Um, uh, so the one thing you need to understand about LLMs is that they will always produce an answer. It might be gibberish, but it's an answer. And if you're not careful, you can easily get lost in, on the surface, it looks great. So big recommendation, if ever you are in this position of using LLMs to produce stuff for complicated tasks, make sure you've got a massive number of constraints written out on the validity of the output that gets produced. And what I was doing here was to ask it to follow these constraints in generating it. It may not do a good job. So you need to externally check, validate, send that stuff back in. You could ask it to do that yourself. This is a very important technique tied to self-discovery, uh, self-improvement technique, where, and this uh, I first saw when I was experimenting with GPT-4. 3.5, the chat GPT that someone mentioned, didn't do this at all well. This is the idea that you uh, take a program, you get an output, and you ask the same machine with a different program to check that output for correct. And, pardon me? No, sir, no, sir. No, there's no learning going on. No weights are being changed. I am simply using another program, which actually I could be using Claude for this or another LLM altogether and saying to it, here is the output. Uh, yeah, right there, what it says at the top. I want, uh, I was, and so an AI system has produced a schedule. What I'm trying to communicate to it is that it may not be perfect. There may be problems here. So you, the system, need to fact check this and check these constraints against what has been produced and label the ones that, that are a problem here, right? Uh, and of course, you have to have an exit condition. So you've got to say, because you're going to put this in a loop, you've got to say that if there are none, if this is good, according to you, LLM, then say it's good and you can exit. You're, you'll have an outer loop running. It's a little bit like the reinforcement learning setup in that there is an uh, agent uh, and there's a system outside that is running that agent, so to speak. It's like that. So, you know, your uh, remark wasn't completely off the wall here. So, yes, so you uh, run it here. You're going to keep running it. So you need an exit condition. So you get that here. And uh, uh, B, I will tell you this. Uh, for this example, 
I have not been able to get this to work well, but self-improvement has worked for us in many examples. Um, I'll give you one concrete example where it worked. A colleague of mine, uh, his job is to, uh, one of his jobs was to write what is called a, a Fed speak system. In this great world of ours, there are a bunch of people known as Federal Reserve Board uh, members. And they go out and give talks about what they think is happening to the economy. You know, interest rates will go up or go down, whatever. It turns out there's a real reason why they do this because they're not allowed to talk to each other, except in that meeting. So they use the press to communicate with each other by making these statements. So now, of course, what it means is that we have access to what they are saying. So we could try to decipher what they are saying. So this is the Fed speak project generally. A bunch of people have worked on it and have results out there. The challenge is you don't want to just say the sentiment is positive or negative. That means nothing. You want to know what are the 40 underlying factors and what is the stance on each of those factors. 40, I'm just making it up, large number of factors. Right, so that's the real problem. So you're going to now produce a report that has a whole ton of detailed information about what those factors are and what those numbers are. How do you know it's grounded in reality? Again, it's plausible, as we said, LLM's plausible result, of course. So what you want to do is you want to put in, and in our case, uh, one of my analyst colleagues uh, saw it and said, you know what, it is saying that there is no support for uh, uh, stance on uh, uh, the labor market, and it follows that by five quotes. Not good. If a human looks at this, they're not going to trust this stuff. So the nat natural question to ask is, can I get another LLM program to look at the output of the first program and identify those statements that are inconsistent with each other? In this case, a very simple inconsistency. And we were able to get a prompt like this to work, not a problem. And when you work, what I mean is you have to be careful here. You don't want it to generate the entire new report because LLMs are very expensive. You don't want them to produce a lot of text. You simply say, give me the number of that item. You number all of these, which is wrong. And so you get a very small output and then iterate and so on. Got it to work. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, oh, and then tied to that is repair. So once you've identified a defect to iterate back to the reinforcement learning analogy, you actually need to repair the program that you had. You can ask the system to repair. Again, didn't work very well here, but this is the schema for repair. Roughly speaking, it's the same as the initial schema for generating the initial schedule, except that you now say, there are a bunch of defects. There is an initial solution. Produce for me a new solution. Okay, thank you. Next. Okay, so um, I'm going to jump on what Vijay said. So I tried a, a simpler version of that problem, but I, I introduced that kind of verifier. Okay, so um, this repair uh, process that PJ um, introduced requires for you to go and, and catch the errors. Okay, and I think that's where the knowledge graphs are coming into uh, place. So let's take a simple program. It doesn't have to do with events. Uh, you want to visit at least one museum, visit an art gallery, maybe it's optional. Um, uh, one Greek restaurant, of course, is a Greek tourist. And um, go to two bookstores, but you shouldn't visit the bookstores consecutively. There must be a break. Um, and the total, be, uh, the total trip should be less than two miles. Okay, so um, I went to the LLM and I asked and I got a few sites. It's actually pretty accurate because I went and I verified the latitude and the longitude that it gives you for the, um, all the uh, landmarks are actually correct. The only thing that doesn't work well is DALI, like the images, they have a lot of errors, by the way. Text works really well, but uh, you know, on the image generation, we're still a little bit behind. You see there's a lot of typos and a lot of inconsistencies. Um, so I use a much simpler prompt here. Uh, these are the constraints, it's a simple verbalization. And in the beginning, I gave it, you know, the list of the museums with their coordinates and then, this time I didn't use rel, I said I'm going to do it in Python. I wrote uh, nine functions that they basically take the, exam, the, the result and they check if these constraints are uh, correct, you know, are satisfied. And if they are not, it gives back the error message, what's going wrong. Uh, you know, you check the types, because sometimes it might present a restaurant as a museum. Th these things can happen. Um, and then this is kind of like the repair that uh, uh, Vijay said, uh, well, you know, you provided this plan, here's the feedback, errors and messages. 
uh, you know, start from what you have and go and um, change it. Now, it turns out it's a very bad idea to give uh, numerical data to an LLM. Um, because at I think the current LLMs, at least today, at least today, tomorrow? we don't know about tomorrow. And, um, you know, they can do addition, they can do multiplication, but it turns out that there are some references that it consume a lot of resource, its resources. Okay. So if it's a, you know, trillion uh, uh, parameters, it uses a lot of its attention to try to make that right. So that didn't work well. It, the, the system wasn't working. It was producing a lot of junk. It was computing the distances, sometimes correct, sometimes wrong. And sometimes it was hallucinating. Uh, you know, it was using the wrong coordinates. Now, um, I try to pre-compute all distances and give that as an input. As you understand, that's something that doesn't scale. And I exceeded the 120K prompt window. Um, besides, what I found very interesting is the pricing of Google. Uh, computing uh, 3,200 distances was about $35, about a thousand times more than the budget I had spent working on the uh, GPT-4. <laughs> um, but, you know, you can compute the nearest neighbor graph. So I, I used the, um, the Python to compute all the geodesic distances. That's kind of like cheap. And then, you know, this is a proxy of the true Manhattan distance or the true uh, walking distance. And I said, if it's less than a mile, then, you know, compute that. So what is important here, what you need to get is that, um, Using the relational information um, into the uh, prompt as a background information, it's much better and much easier for the LLM to consume other than you know giving numerical information. So just saying that these are the neighbors and this is the distance, because it can do this simple addition. Okay, I'm going from this restaurant to the other restaurant. It means I can add the distances and, and get an estimate of where things are. Um, and uh, I only used uh, 322 calls and I paid $3, still much more expensive what, what I paid for the GPT-4. Now, um, something interesting as I was playing with that is that um, you know, for each distance, I had to pay one cent. But you can actually ask the LLM and say, do not use Python to compute the distance. Try to estimate it. And it came with a pretty good uh, uh, answer here when I asked it to compute the distances. Um, basically, it found out from the addresses how many blocks uh, they are apart. So it kind of computed a rough estimate. And it was here it says uh, 2 to 2.5 miles, and the true distance is, you know, 1.6. It's not that bad. Okay. Uh, and what is even surprising can do for other cities. This is my house. Oh, now you got my address. Okay. <laughs> Very secure. Uh, to the supermarket. And it says that they're the same code. It, it starts getting it. So it's, it's a little bit off. It was says it's about a mile. It's, it's half a mile. Um, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be a great idea if we're actually putting into the pre-training data the open maps so it can start having an idea. But the way that you put the open maps is not with coordinates. You would put it as the graph, you know, like the, the road graph. Um, now, uh, it worked really well. So. On the average, uh, it works like it takes about 1.6 trials to get you to give you a right uh, uh, trip. It takes about 13 seconds. Now, I did some benchmarking. What if I try to randomly generate a path, you know, go from here to there? And, I, and I'm putting some effort, not just like, just give me five destinations. I just make sure that the, the destination of the one is the origin of the other. So it's a continuous path. So it takes about 500 trials until it finds something that satisfies the constraint. So we do know that it works much better than you know, randomization. Of course, that takes a minute because right now it's much faster to, to run a random path on my, um, on my graph, or on, on my computer versus what ChatGPT is taking, but th all these things are, uh, are becoming better. If I was using Grok, maybe it would have been as fast. Now, what you don't see over here is, well, where's your graph database? Why don't you compute that with a graph query? Is that a valid question? Because there is one problem. I mean, you could technically for this one, you could, and it's a small problem. It would it would work well, but it doesn't work for any constraint. And some of them, in many cases, if you are trying to find paths, it will actually the query optimizer will have to generate all. It will have to brute force it. So it doesn't take long until your query optimizer basically comes into this. Uh, actually, behaves worse than that. 
because this one randomly will, will get faster rather than your query optimizer will end up brute forcing all paths, all possible paths in order to give you an answer. So um, I think the knowledge graphs and the graph databases are excellent at verifying the constraints. They might give you an answer, but what you actually get out of the language model is that it gives you in constant time, okay? Modulo how many times you will have to repeat to satisfy the constraints. So this is the final trip. It's, you can you can see all the satisfies the constraint. It's about 1.6 miles. The family is happy. Spiro is happy. So um, you know I did try to solve it before we did tried the self discovery with chain of thought that it, it it failed. It was trying to generate code. It wasn't make making sense. Um, I did talk about a graph engine. Uh, we did talk about KGs, uh, how how good they are at. Um, expressing these constraints. And here I wrote them in Python. Uh, now, once the constraints have become bigger, this idea of writing a function for every constraint makes it cumbersome. Plus, some of the constraints might actually include looking up a database or fact-checking things, OK? So what if I say, do not go to a restaurant that you know Nico has also been there. So he will have to check some kind of transactions or history to see that this is satisfied. Um, you know, we're actually working right now on uh, on uh, increasing the constraint complexity. Oh, sorry, but let's go to another problem where we use the verifier to to make it actually work. So this is um, uh, this is a <coughs> problem, and it's it's kind of interesting. We have a blog post. The day we created the presentation was the day that uh, uh, Daniel Kam <coughs> Kahneman passed away. So it actually came exactly the same day. We didn't know about that. We're working on this problem. So you've worked up, you thought about, um, you know, about like thinking fast and slow. I'm running out of time. I'll just go quickly. So war, immediately, instinctively, you say peace. Uh, it's fast, but it's prone to error. And that's kind of like an example where I give you a problem. You get it wrong. Um, you know, you can start working it out on a symbolic uh, uh, reasoner on Python, and you actually get it right. Okay, and um, now I'm going to, this is a standard benchmark, the, the blocks world planning, where you start with some blocks in an initial configuration and you have to end up in a, in a final configuration. You have some valid actions and some constraints and you have to generate the plan. I, I wanna say that there's a lot of work that has been done over there and people have published papers where they give the beginning and the end and they're just checking if the plan is correct. We actually did something else. We had the verifier coming step after step. And if you do that, you increase your, your, um, your accuracy much better. So if you can correct the model in the process, it's much, much better than waiting for it to do everything and then say that it's wrong. So um, we have a demo. This is like a small Streamly app that Giancarlo uh, made. Um, you, you know, it kind of visualizes what's happening in every action. And there's this, some cases say, well, this action was invalid. That's what went wrong. And it keeps doing that until um, it generates a solution. So um, this is actually uh, something that we're taking into more complicated problems like now, like supply chain. You know, so we're looking for more difficult planning problems. And uh, now I'm going to talk about another optimization problem, which is the famous diet problem, you know, where the idea is that uh, you're trying to make the perfect dish for you to eat and satisfy nutritional um, uh, constraints. And as I was doing that, BJ found this on LinkedIn. Apparently, GE is actually using uh, the Google Cloud, and they see what you have in your fridge, and they tell you what to cook or what you can cook, okay? And I saw that and I said, well, yeah, let's see if we can, I didn't think we could do that. It turns out, you do that. Um, so this is the problem. This is your knowledge graph. Um, and um, this is, you know, what you basically, uh, this is how you would, this is a very common problem in optimize. If you ever take, you take an optimization course, this is like a standard benchmark. Like this is the, one of the first exercises you do in linear programming. So that's what we describe over here. So, um, in our language, we can actually, you can actually run optimization problems in our knowledge graph. So you can code it as a, uh, as a graph query if you want. Uh, 
uh, as a reasoning query, it's logic. And um, this is the problem, uh, more created the equations and then uh, John Winston coded that. And if we had time, we'll show you it's kind of like there's a natural one-to-one -one correspondence. So it does pre, pre so it does generate a dish, but the dish is disgusting. You know, if you see them, the optimization problem doesn't really know the optimizer what it's, you know, this is the knowledge that we have, but uh, Gurobi doesn't know. And there's no way that you can go and encode which ingredients go with each other. This is combinatorially, um, uh, you know, very difficult. And uh, yes, so we did take the results and we gave them to the language model and said, well, that's absolutely not a great dish. Uh, try again. So what we do is we basically this is the combination of this is um, uh, sorry combination of uh, ingredients that it's invalid and we go and we put it back as a constraint. Well, you know, generate a solution, but not this one because it's disgusting. And we try with iterations, but as you can understand, we had seven thousand ingredients. Take the all possible permutations of five ingredients. It's going to take a lot of time until. And then your constraints will start growing, growing exponentially, and you will never get um, a solution. So surprisingly, the language model can actually solve the problem on its own. And it was really uh, impressive how it did it. So um, I didn't have much time, so I, I restricted myself to 100 ingredients. And I asked the, the simple constraints, the calorie has to be between 800 to 1200 the protein and the, uh, and the carbs. And it came up with some uh, valid recipes. I'll show you some examples. Um, this is, you know, how the prompt. Um, uh, and, so, right, okay, now I did a trick over here. I, I made everything an integer, so I made, you know, the arithmetic easier for it, okay? So uh, it did satisfy, um, and it actually gave me the way to cook it, you know, so it gives you the instructions how to cook the dish. And it makes sure that the, the um, it actually here says, well, you told me 1200, but I went slightly off. So I'm not 1200. But then I asked it to retry and I say, can you make sure that it complies with like the French cuisine? Um, and it worked. But uh, as you can see, when I asked for Hawaiian, the carbs went up. I noticed that I've given it a very low requirement of carbs. And I asked it to correct it. Um, and it did correct it, actually. But then I asked it about something even more difficult. I said, I want you to use potatoes or pasta because I know they are high in, in carbs. And, you know, it again went way and above. This, see something over here that it only used 50 grams. It could have given me like one gram of pasta to keep, but it knows that this is not really valid. And it tried a whole wheat pasta to keep it low, okay? And I, and I still say that um, you are, you know, that's not what I want. And now it switches to potatoes, okay? And actually it switches to sweet potatoes because they are lower in carb. Um, now, <coughs> my thought is that Whenever you have to deal with an optimization problem that has a combinatorial number of constraints, you cannot follow the original path. You have to go with the distribution. And the language models, if there is something that they know they, 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 they can model very well, it's the distribution. This is, it's called a language model because it's a probabilistic model. People have been trying to model the probability of words being together, and these words can represent a lot of other stuff. So, um, you know, there is a great way to actually combine traditional optimization and language models. And again, optimization is reasoning and reasoning belongs to knowledge graphs. That's how all these things are connected. We're all getting into this universal platform where all these things um, have to be, um, uh, you know, uh, together. So um, just, you know, a couple of papers. So the question is what, what's happening if we want um, more difficult constraints. The answer is, I don't know if you've seen that, the uh, Lean Dojo is a way of doing um, uh, interactive theory improving, where basically you have, um, this is the verifier here, it's a math prover, and here's the, the language model trying to generate different directions of proving a theorem, and Lean tells you if it's uh, correct or not. And um, that's a paper from Meta, where they basically, uh, you know, trained with a lot of synthetic data and they teach the language model how to do 
uh, combinatorial optimization, um, or let's say difficult optimization. This is not combinatorial, this is A star here. And so basically use your knowledge graph to simulate the problem, generate tons of data, fine tune your language model, and then uh, use it as a constant time solver. Okay, so uh, we have one minute, Vijay, you're gonna wrap this up. These are the confessions of a Gen AI programmer. <laughs> Is yeah. you know we got Madonna confessions on the dance floor confessions on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is the takeaway from my point of view today. A year later into this journey of really trying to use this for uh, production quality code, it's amazing technology, but a complete bear to work with to try to get stuff in production. I think I've explained some of the challenges. Uh, here are you know first of all bunches of places where it works quite well. So we know those patterns. We can use them there. Not a problem. Um, uh, and again, I'm talking GPT-4 class LLMs, but there are you know, just some simple example. I spent the last two days trying to get the thing to work correctly on executing the plan from for Spiro. Uh, I can tell you tons of details about how did that, that did not go well. Um, so the basic problem here is, let me just mention this, continuous programs. How do you debug when your program is a piece of text you can add stuff to it, take away stuff, remove a semicolon, remove a colon, and you have a black box. You're getting no feedback other than does it produce the final answer on whether you did the right thing or not. It's a bear to try to debug these systems. Let's go to the last slide. Um, well, there's a beginning of a methodology on how to successfully program in this space. Uh, as they say, you know, the proof is in the margins. So <laughs> you can, we can talk about this later. And I just mentioned, I don't hope people remember these folks, this is Newell and Simon, the GPS stuff that they did a long time ago, it's coming back, the general purpose solver, that's what we're doing. Symbols, connecting symbols, uh, proving, doing things in the real world with connections of symbols now through LLMs. And just the last slide is simply a whole lot more to do. This, I did this at IBM Research, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. A bunch of things are crossed out. I should cross them out, but there's so much still left to do outside. So much to do. Thank you. Sorry if it took so long. I was hoping to have some questions, but uh, maybe we'll just stay back and if people have questions, they can talk. Seconds over time. Yeah. Big thank you to Google Slides for letting me edit them online. Thank you.